All right, you're looking good. All right, great. Um, well, thanks, thanks very much, Kyle and Mustafa. That really is uh, uh, an honor to, to give a talk to you today. I'm going to be um, talking about, this is going to be a really tough water year, I think probably all over the West and, and uh, um, Arizona, California, all the Western states. And, and so we're going to see a, probably a lot of criticism of alfalfa during a drought. And I wanted to address some of that um, and uh, give, give you a little bit of ammunition to, to think through this issue. Well, of course, um, really the whole West has been in a drought now for well over a year and 2022 doesn't look like it's shaping up to be any different. And um, uh, you can see these kinds of headlines uh, about uh, farmers and how they're gonna have to deal with it. This is the current um, um, drought, um, drought map. Um, it seems to me that, uh, that they've run out of adjectives. They have severe, they have extreme, and they have exceptional drought. Um, I'm not sure what all of those means, but it, you know, it looks pretty bad. And, and unfortunately, it's gonna be really a tough year for, for farmers in, in California, and I think many other Western states as well. Uh, however, you know, we do get this uh, last fall, we had this uh, record high rainfall of seven inches of one day in Northern California. Uh, this is my backyard rain ga gauge. You can see that uh, we don't always uh, have zero rain during periods of time. And I think that's kind of a, a key point here is that sometimes really it's the variation in supplies that are more important than drought itself. Um, and so this is, a, for example, showing the flooding in 2017 that we saw in uh, many parts of California and then of Folsom Lake in 2022 and 21 looked pretty miserable um, and, and just uh, in terms of variation in water supplies. Uh, so we have this problem with feast and famine um, and that's true in the Colorado River Basin, which is of course Arizona's um, uh, lifeblood and, and um, many parts of Southern California as well. And, and, and the variation in supplies are actually to some degree more important than actual drought itself. So irrigated alfalfa is really pretty significant in the United States. It's something like 45 to 52% of the US alfalfa is produced in irrigated regions. And it's often the number one water user in, in some of the, many of these Western states. No longer in California, it's uh, orchards that are number one uh, water user in California, particularly almonds. But this shows you the uh, tonnage produced in the major Western states as of 2018. It's actually, California is down quite a bit from that from uh, four years ago uh, due to the low acreage. But uh, you, we're, we're right at 52% in that year of the nation's uh, alfalfa hay supply um, in the United States. We have Idaho, California, Montana, Utah, Arizona, Colorado, Washington, all being pretty important in the hay states. But we are also especially impacted by drought. It looks like this is a calculation done uh, showing the, the different droughts that we've been through, uh, the 2012 through 2017 drought. Uh, then of course, this one really began in late 2020 and now we're in the throes of it. And according to this calculation, about 50% of uh, nationwide of our alfalfa hay acreage is considered to be in drought, either severe, extreme, or exceptional. And of course, the Colorado River Basin is particularly um, impacted with regards to alfalfa hay and forages, tame hays and other types of things. Uh, sorry for the background noise. I'm actually here in <laughs> vacation with my extended family. So you might get a little, ex a little bit of extra noise here. So, um, but we have to remember that alfalfa is really the basis of a food producing system. Um, and, and um, Asha, could you see if they could remain a little quiet over there? Okay. Um, so starting with water and soil, going through forages and dairy cows and producing food that we eat every day. So I think this is one thing we have to remind people that this is actually a food producing system. It's not just, you know, hay or, that, that is uh, not relevant to human beings. But water is also really the key issue here. Water is really the driving force for, um, for plant growth. And without it, uh, we just uh, are unable to produce highly productive field crops or any type of crop. And, and so 
at, at the fundamental level, once once you you have lack of um, lack of trigger pressure in in plants, you it re results in actually yield losses. So we have to remember that. It's really the key limiting resource in irrigated regions, but also in many non-irrigated regions as well. The principle that we need to, we need to uh, think through is how to produce more crop per drop of irrigation water that's available uh, or residual water that's available. And alfalfa has a pretty important role to play there um, in terms of its uh, biological characteristics. First of all, it's economically important. Secondly, it produces important, important important food products to the public. Uh, if you do the calculations, alfalfa can produce over 2,000 gallons of milk per acre uh, based upon the University of Wisconsin uh, uh, gallons per ton milk per ton calculations. It's very high in water use efficiency. It's highly flexible under variable supplies, under low water or maybe even high water conditions. And it's also saline tolerant and it provides significant environmental services, which the general public may appreciate more than its agricultural value in terms of wildlife and soil health. So why are the deep roots pretty important in, in terms of water? Well, first of all, it starts right away in the spring. You don't have to irrigate an annual crop to get established. Um, it, is, it utilizes residual moisture very successfully. Uh, because of the deep roots, it, it, it's difficult really to water past the root zone during crop production. And um, it also can survive droughts because of this extensive uh, root system. And also it, it uh, helps control nitrates in the groundwater, which is a significant uh, pollution issue and leads to improved soil health in rotation and sequestration, sequestration of carbon. So this is some uh, illustration over on the right hand side, you can see a, a graph that was developed in the Imperial Valley of California a long time ago, showing roots down to about 15 feet. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see the role of alfalfa uh, causing uh, really reduced groundwater nitrate levels compared with sorghum or peanuts or, or dairy farms. Uh, alfalfa really does help with uh, nitrate pollution issues. This is an illustration of the value of deep roots in, in alfalfa. Uh, last year, we uh, the Tule Lake Basin, the uh, um, Klamath Basin up in Oregon and California was completely cut off from their water. Uh, they only have a, had about six inches of winter rains, but they get, they have, this is actually the July uh, regrowth showing pretty much a full, um, full canopy and a full production for two full cuttings of the year. This is our data from our variety trials there showing about six to seven tons and two cuttings uh, with just residual moisture. And uh, what's, what's going on there? Well, first of all, this is a very, very uh, good soils. These are high organic matter soils with excellent water holding capacity. And uh, the roots were probably down much greater than eight feet. We stopped at eight feet. Um, but you can see here the tremendous root systems that are able to extract moisture from depth. And that's a pretty important uh, characteristic of alfalfa hay. Uh, now, this I'll have to add that this is pretty specific to those soils because they are uh, so forgiving with uh, regards to water and high water use efficiency. But at the same time, these soils would have to be replenished uh, if that crop was to continue production for a second year after this. The other biological advantages above ground production is very, very high in terms of water use efficiency because we're, we have essentially 100% water use, 100% harvest. The water use efficiency in terms of pounds per inch are excellent and uh, certainly uh, superior to many other crops. Um, the, the other characteristic is that it can survive summer dry down periods, uh, which is, as I said, sometimes an involuntary issue where uh, water is allocated to environmental purposes like in the Klamath Basin and in many parts of California where that occurs. Um, that this is uh, the case in 2001 and again in 2021, uh, water was cut off from farming for endangered species. And of course, uh, this not, didn't make a lot of people very happy. Uh, we, you know, it was a really tremendous problem with, with agricultural uh, sustainability. 
So in terms of the biological advantages, um, it's, it has the ability to be deficit irrigated. That means irrigate less than the full requirement of the crop. And we've done a whole range of studies as I think at University of Arizona has also done a, a, a number of studies on this, looking at fully irrigated versus various types of deficit irrigation strategies. And generally it works pretty well with um, um, very little loss in, in stand. Um, except under certain desert conditions, I think we, we see a lot more loss of stand uh, than we do in many parts of, of California. This is an example of uh, after two years of continual drought, this is a trial that we have in the Western Fresno County, other than tremendous amounts of uh, gopher damage, uh, that crop uh, survived pretty well after two summers of lack of irrigation. We rewatered the crop, it came back pretty effectively. Again, very deep soils, uh, uh, fertile soils, but this is under high salinity conditions too. So the idea here is that you will produce most of your crop under the uh, springtime conditions, winter and spring conditions where the water use efficiency is very high and the ET, the evaporative demands are very low. And um, this, this works because um, most, most of the time, 60 to 70% of the yields are achieved in alfalfa before um, the mid-July period. And this is, a, this is a Mediterranean situation, and this is in the Intermountain area. And you can see here that about 62% um, in the case of the Mediterranean zone, and also in the uh, Intermountain area is produced in the first several cuttings of the year. Um, uh, the same is true actually in, in the Southern uh, deserts um, in Imperial Valley. We see a tremendous um, reduction in yields late in the summer. And so you're producing most of your top yields early in the year. And so that's a really a strength of the crop that we can partially irrigate those first several cuttings and then cut it off if we have to. Just some additional data from data, Davis showing uh, different uh, dry down periods. Uh, we had 50% uh, up to 75% of full. And you can see that in, as in the July cutting, we start seeing some uh, effects of the deficit irrigation and more in the August cutting and September cutting. You can see the most severe deficits are not yielding much. But the fact is that you have this yield pattern over the season it's a very clear yield pattern. And so this, this is something that, um, um, that is um, important in terms of alfalfa. We were able to irrigate the crop. Uh, the e full ET requirement of the crop is about 40 inches. We irrigated the 50% dry down at 19 inches and then 30 inches at the, um, at the 75%. And we had one treatment where we just partially irrigated um, through the last half of the season. So that's a gradual dry down later in the season. And both of them came out pretty similarly. Um, you can see here that uh, percent yields were about 80% of full yields in the 50% treatment and pretty close to almost 100% of full yields on the 75% uh, um, um, uh, application. Similar types of results were seen in Colorado with, uh, with dry downs looking at uh, uh, these are short season environments stopping irrigation after the second or uh, first irrigation. And, um, and of course they had a 10, 10, about 10 inches of precipitation there. Um, after uh, the, the real strength of this concept is that after this kind of forced dry down, uh, you can rewater these plots, generally speaking, and the, and the crop will recover. This is the Colorado data. Um, showing that recovery, this uh, third year of trials. And this is some uh, data from the Fresno County area in Tulare, uh, Tulare, California, showing upon rewatering these deficit treatments, even though you lost yield for the years that you had to do that, um, you were able to recover the yields in the, in the following year when presumably the water situation improves. In terms of the deficit strategies, we'd recommend watering early with available moisture target full irrigations for as many cuts, cuts as possible. Uh, we don't think fall irrigation makes sense. Uh, there, you know, we, could, we could explore that further, but we've found that, first of all, it's, it's oftentimes the water is not available, but um, uh, it's probably better just to wait until the crop is ready to recover in the er winter and the early spring and start irrigating in early spring periods. Um, 
early season irrigations are very important to fill that profile. And in a drought year, I think it's particularly important to fill that profile. Uh, start early. Uh, don't wait until the crop is fully, um, fully stressed before you start irrigating and pay attention to other issues like soil fertility issues upon recovery. This is an example. We did this at Davis under center pivots um, with early irrigation showing the crop recovering. This is 2021 with our severe drought that we had last year, showing that the tremendous yield uh, advantage of those earlier, uh, earlier growth periods. And you can see these, uh, these plots here had no early irrigation and really were very slow to recover. Lots of variability because of soil types and so forth. So um, it's really important to sustain alfalfa production during these drought periods and whether they're regulatory or water transfers. And yields are generally reduced, but the crop mostly recovers. We've had some difficulties in the Blythe area and also in El Centro with that due to the cracking soil types. But in general, we would recommend a full irrigation follow, followed by a cold turkey type of approach. Um, we also would want to look at agronomic practices to recover um, that crop after these kinds of stresses like soil fertility, phosphorus and potassium in particular are probably going to be pretty important upon recovery from uh, uh, say a two or three month uh, lack of irrigation water. The other advantage of alfalfa really for this type of um, situation with uh, periodic droughts is salinity tolerance. This is a graph that was generated by the uh, Australians showing that in their opinion, alfalfa is one of the more salt of tolerant crops, even more so than, than barley or wheat, um, and certainly than uh, rice. Tall wheat grass at very, very high levels is certainly a very uh, salt tolerant uh, crop. Salt bush as well, salt bush of course, is not really a crop um, and tall wheatgrass has actually got fairly limited markets. So for moderately saline uh, affected soils and saline waters, alfalfa is actually some uh, crop that should be considered to be fairly tolerant if it's established, if you can get it established on those difficult soils. This is some examples of some recent data that we generated um, with 35 alfalfa varieties um, in Western Fresno County, where we irrigated the crops with uh, eight to 11 decisiemens per meter um, to the saline plots and compared them with a normal uh, west side water, which was about one and a half uh, decisiemens per meter, and um, found that there was, uh, in the first couple of years, fairly moderate um, um, yield penalties, 22% in the first couple of years. But in the third year, it goes up to about 31%, averaged about 22% over a four year period. Um, and so certainly long term effects on soils and, and soil health is going to be a consideration. And there will need to be a, set, a long term salinity management program if you're going to be using real difficult water like this. Um, and these are kind of extreme examples with uh, the salinity in the soil at the end of this trial went up to about 12 to 16 decisiemens per meter, which is pretty, uh, pretty salt affected. And, um, and, and so it's kind of an extreme example, but it did show that even with those high salinity levels, the uh, tons per acre were quite respectable and economically, economically viable for that region at 10 tons per acre. We looked at yield differences in varieties and saw some of those differences. Some of those varieties actually did really well under high saline conditions. You can see this slope here. Uh, the, some of the ones that were uh, really top level under high saline conditions were also fairly respectable under, uh, under, under the low salinity conditions were also very high yielding under the high salinity conditions. But you have to be careful because some people will look at these that are uh, low yielding under normal conditions, but also low yielding under, under saline conditions. So we have to be uh, real careful about selection uh, of variety, but there are varieties that are more saline tolerant. Uh, the one thing that I think we need to pay some more attention to is what we call flood managed aquifer recharge or flood mar 
which the uh, Department of Water Resources here in California has been dealing with or been have a pro has a program on this. Um, and the idea here is that with the rivers flowing um, in excess during certain times of the year, uh, you know, how is it that we can capture those flows? And of course, the traditional method is to build a, a dam and a reservoir. Um, but um, that's, of course, uh, a steep hill to climb, particularly in California, uh, under current conditions, uh, political conditions. And uh, so the, the idea here is to capture some of that flow and push it into groundwater, because we have our groundwater is definitely very affected by, uh, by these droughts. And the idea there is to use the ex existing infrastructure and ag lands to recharge uh, aquifers that can be pumped out la uh, later. These would be largely gravity applied. Um, alfalfa and pasture and orchards and vineyards and fallow are all candidates for this. Um, there's a consideration that we need to protect groundwater quality. In other words, uh, for, for example, in some of our uh, high vegetable crop production areas, we have to be careful about uh, nitrate uh, contamination of aquifers. And, um, and so that could be an issue with some crops um, under those situations or even fallow. And then the other consideration is, will, will we do damage to our uh, orchard or pasture or, or alfalfa? Alfalfa tends to be a lower risk crop than some, but it certainly is uh, possible to kill alfalfa under flooding conditions. But we've been doing some experiments uh, on this uh, issue up in the Intermountain area. We applied 28 acre feet of water to, um, to a soil type there that was very permeable that, um, and the crop seemed to do fine. Um, in the San Joaquin Valley, we've been applying um, up to uh, 12, the 14 acre feet of water in winter periods that um, the crop seems to do okay with it. Uh, Khaled Bali and his colleagues down at Kearney Ag Center, um, um, we tried doing these continuous flows, which didn't seem to work as well as uh, pulsed flows because you allow the crop to recover uh, its oxygen levels in the soil. And this is showing the oxygen levels and the water applied um, and it shows that when you apply water, of course, the oxygen level in the soil goes down, but you don't want it to get to down below a certain level, in which case you would uh, have a problem with uh, the crop surviving. Uh, it could kill alfalfa for sure. And, um, and so this pulsed idea where you're putting like uh, six, seven inches of water per week, uh, intermittent flooding with some allowing for recovery seems to work pretty well. And it's over, uh, uh, over that period of time, uh, we put in about 89 inches in uh, 2021 with really no negative effects. In fact, there was somewhat of a positive effect on yield. We can see here with winter flooding. Um, now this is, we had also treatments where we looked at the previous year's um, um, summer, summer dry down. So, so the ones on the left were deficit, the orange were deficit irrigated in the previous year. So they were obviously a little bit lower yielding, but with winter flooding, uh, you can see that the crop recovered um, a little bit better than, than when there's no winter flooding. And I think that's partly because we're re refilling that profile in the early spring and allowing better growth. Now, obviously we can kill alfalfa. This is a, in a, a aerial photograph from Ohio uh, showing that you can see the 52 inches of rain in 2091 succeeded in killing the crop for, uh, other than where the, the subsoil drains were located. And, um, and so this is obviously a problem if we're not, uh, we can't control what we're doing. So it's all about drainage and uh, soil type as well, making sure you have good infiltration rates. Remember that alfalfa, and this is something that our colleagues in the city needs to, need to understand, is that alfalfa provides a tremendous amount of environmental services and a lot of it's due to the fact that we're irrigating it. It, you know, in addition to providing food source, it protects, protects the soil, improves the soil quality. It reduces the end fertilizer requirements for, uh, for other crops, uh, wheat and, and uh, corn and other crops, uh, vegetables. Um, it absorbs nitrates from depth, provides an insectary, supports wildlife habitat, and, and contributes to CO2 fixation. 
And um, it's pretty important for sustainability uh, uh, metrics uh, for the future. Um, in summary, alfalfa has some unique biological values to provide resilience in the water in certain future. And, and you know, unlike some who paint a picture that, well, we shouldn't be growing some of these crops in, in the West because they just use too much water. Um, you know, there's some truth to that. Alfalfa has a big water uh, footprint, but at the same time, it has some of these unique characteristics that are, um, are pretty hard uh, to come by with other crops. I mean, with many annual crops, if you deficit irrigate to 50%, uh, you're likely to get zero in terms of production. And so that's a key issue. Uh, because of the deep roots, because of the high water use efficiency and the ability to be dried down in the summer and its salinity to tolerance and ability to contribute to groundwater recharge, uh, alfalfa is really kind of a key crop uh, for uh, these kinds of um, situations where we're going to have highly variable water supplies. And, and if we're honest with ourselves, that's likely to be the norm in the future rather than the exception. So with that, you know, I, that's all I had to come up with today. Um, maybe open it up to questions um, if anybody has any. And by the way, I, I think you'd have to repeat the questions. So thank you, Dan. Any questions for that? Thank you, Dan. Okay, well, thanks for, for the invitation and I really enjoyed it. I'll have to sign off now, but uh, good luck on the rest of your program. Thanks. Thanks.